In this lecture on uh, rock mass properties, I'm going to be discussing the issues of uh, uh, rock mass behavior where the intact pieces that we discussed in the last uh, lecture number three uh, are now separated by discontinuities and although tightly interlocking, have a much weaker strength performance. In the opening slide here, you see a road cut in Greece and uh, it's obvious from the uh, folding and uh, deformation that's occurred in that rock mass that we're no longer dealing with anything like an intact material. Engineers love to have numbers uh, to use in their calculations and there is a, a great pressure uh, to categorize rock in terms of, of some kind of number that you can use to calculate properties. And in my opinion, that's the wrong way of approaching the problem because we're dealing with geology as given to us. And so to me, the starting point and the fundamental requirement in any rock engineering project is the presence of a very good, well-trained engineering geologist or geological engineer or geologist with some understanding of the concepts of mechanics who's familiar with the local geography and, and geology and who can understand what the uh, process he's involved in uh, is aiming at. So that uh, uh, somebody who understands the origins and characteristics of the, of the rock mass is, is a really key component of that process. And let's forget the numbers until later in the process. This uh, map shows the tectonic plate boundaries and earthquake locations around the world. And the yellow dots are sites that I've worked on around the world. And you'll see that they vary from uh, uh, benign conditions in southern Africa, which is a very stable continent. Uh, it's surrounded by a large plate. There are no major active tectonic boundaries. And so it tends to be a very stable continent with very predictable conditions which you'll see later in the lecture. On the other hand, a lot of the projects I've worked on are associated with major mountain change, the Andes, the Himalayas, the Rockies, and uh, these are totally different in character in terms of their rock mass behavior because the rock very often has been tectonically deformed and uh, uh, the, the uh, sheer strength of the discontinuities is entirely different from those in a stable environment. And that has to be recognized when you start a project that you might be in a totally different geological environment to one in which some author working in a, in a different environment has written a paper which you propose to follow. Be aware that not all methodology is applicable to all rock masses. There are differences. Similarly, uh, again, as a result of plate tectonic movements, the stresses in the Earth's crust are entirely different. So that uh, in a, in a uh, stable continent, continent like Africa, very often we measured horizontal stresses much lower than the vertical stresses. And uh, I, I started my career there and was used to uh, horizontal stresses of about one-sixth of the vertical stress. And I remember visiting Australia and everything was turned 90 degrees and I couldn't understand it until I realized that their stress field is entirely different. And particularly in the mountain chains, uh, the horizon, because of the, of the mountain formation process, the compression that occurs, you can have very high horizontal stresses. And uh, you can have spalling at, at relatively shallow depths because the uh, stresses are high enough to induce it. So the first process that we have to go through in developing a rock mass model for a project is the geological model. And here's, a, here's an example of one for a tunnel in Greece, the Metsovo Tunnel, on the Ignatia Highway, which runs right across northern Greece and passes through the Pindos Mountains, which are the tail end of the Alps uh, in the rest of Europe. And uh, uh, the geologist who's made up this, this geological model has gone right back uh, to the origins of, of uh, that particular uh, bit of the Earth's crust, the, the plate tectonic movements that's taken place the formation of a subduction zone through various geological ages. And you see the four uh, pictures there uh, depicting these stages of the evolution of the Earth's crust in that location. And finally, uh, zooming in on the tunnel location, 
uh, shown on the right there. Uh, it's very important to recognize when you're setting out to, to design this tunnel that it's gone through that geological history and that you have built into the rock all of the uh, problems that have been created by the geological process. Now, there's also a question of scale, which is tremendously important, because uh, we, we, in the last lecture, talked about core recovery, and you're talking about core of uh, 50 millimeter, typically diameter, and 100 meters long, and that's in no way representative of a slope which might be 1,000 meters high, or a tunnel that might be uh, 50 meters uh, in span. So that uh, you have to consider the scale, and uh, it's very difficult to, to come up with simple numerical solutions that then incorporate an automatic adjustment for scale. And in my view, it's much better done by simply going back to basics and thinking through the problem and saying, what kind of scale of problem am I dealing with? And how do I incorporate that into my, into my engineering model? And this picture shows that you can go anywhere from the top uh, intact behavior through to uh, very, very strongly structurally controlled behavior where you have one or two discontinuities in the size of, of uh, rock mass that you're dealing with, which in the case of a tunnel might be 10 meters. In the case of a 1,000 meter high slope might be 100 meters. Uh, what, what kind of discontinuities exist in that, in that volume of rock? And all the way then through to multiply jointed rock masses, which I'll show you examples of in a moment. So, for example, in the Chukicamata open pit mine in Chile, uh, the pit is currently one kilometer deep. And if you look at the photograph on the upper left, you'll see that the benches, which are each 18 meters high, are clearly defined by the structural features. Uh, you have wedges and blocks which fall out uh, simply because the, the, they are uh, defined by structural, intersecting structural features, and they fall out under gravity. On the other hand, in the, in the thousand meter high slope, when you stand back and look at that, it almost looks like a soil, uh, a sandy soil with, with small particles. The particles might be five meters in size, but on that scale, it looks very homogeneous. We still incorporate the major features, such as faults and shear zones, as discrete elements in our analyses, but we're justified there in treating the whole rock mass as a homogeneous uh, material. Water is extremely important. And it can cause huge problems in tunneling, mainly from a construction point of view. It's just a nuisance. You've got to get rid of it. But it also has uh, pressure implications. Uh, and uh, in, in slope stability, it's extremely important because it causes uh, a reduction in the shear strength of the material due to the generation of internal uh, pore pressures or pressures on discontinuity surfaces. So it's really necessary to, to build a hydrological model in parallel to the geological model in order to, to end up with a complete description of rock mass behavior. Now, the starting point for most of our current thinking on rock mass behavior goes back to people like Don Deere uh, in, uh, at the University of Illinois, and uh, who proposed a, a very simple classification based on core recovery. And it generally assumes that you have intact blocks of hard rock, uh, tightly interlocked with their neighbors, if they're still in situ and undisturbed, and uh, that the behavior of the mass is really a function of, of how those blocks can move, rotate, deform, and sometimes break. But primarily, the behavior of the rock mass is controlled by the discontinuities, by the shear strength, and by the three-dimensional orientation of those discontinuities in the mass. And at the one, one end of the scale, if we have massive rock with, with very widely spaced discontinuities, the uh, failures are clearly structurally defined. So you see there on the left a wedge failure in an open pit mine bench where two intersecting planes have created a situation where the, the wedge simply slides out along the line of intersection. Uh, and on the right, you see a potential toppling failure where the the major joints are dipping into the slope rather than out of it, and where a, a tall column will tend to gradually topple over. The consequences of those two types of failure are quite different, uh, but they're both controlled by 
by uh, structural features rather than by the properties of the intact material. And similarly in, in a tunnel, this is a tunnel in Wales, uh, built perhaps 120 years ago, and uh, through a, a, a slate quarry uh, bench, and you can see that the structural uh, definition of the failure there is very, very strong, and wedges in the roof simply fall out under gravity. There, were, there was no support applied in those days in the building of tunnels. And again, you see on the left there a tightly interlocking hard rock mass, uh, which although it's fairly ragged, still enables us to build a steep, stable slope. Um, incidentally, it's very difficult to achieve perfect blasting in a, in a rock mass like that because the, the, the near surface blocks are big enough that they'll fall out and give you a very ragged surface. So uh, people tend to look very hard to see perfect blasting results, which are not always to achieve, but possible to achieve simply because the rock doesn't allow you to do that. The slide on the right is interesting because that's a, a, a reconstruction of the arch over the original entrance to the Olympic Stadium uh, 2,800 years ago in Greece. And there's no cement in that arch. It's simply blocks which have been cut and formed into an arch by putting them over a formwork and then taking the formwork over. And so clearly there's a, there's a rock mass with zero tensile strength forming a very stable and very strong structure. And you see many, as you go through Europe, you see many old arch bridges uh, built exactly like that. So rock masses tend to be very strong in compression and extremely weak, in fact, zero strength in tension. That's something we have to recognize. And just to summarize again, uh, in a hard rock mass, the behavior is dependent almost entirely on the orientation and the shear strength of the discontinuities. But as shown in the, in the lower right, if you have a tectonically deformed rock mass, typically of those that we find in the Andes or the Alps or the, or the Himalayas, uh, the structure has been almost completely destroyed by tectonic movement. The, even the intact pieces of rock may have been broken or sheared, and you have an entirely different uh, form of behavior. So that uh, here's a, an example from Venezuela, where you see uh, at the tunnel face, the rock mass has been very heavily sheared. Uh, there, there's almost no uh, recognizable structure to it now. And on the lower right, you see the consequence of that uh, uh, massive deformation failure, squeezing as we call it, in a tunnel. Now, putting all of that together, there have been many attempts to build up a uh, series of classifications or characterizations uh, for uh, determining the numbers that engineers really do need for designing in, in rock masses. And I'm only going to deal with one of these, which is the geological strength index, uh, which, and the, the prime publication for that is by myself and, and Paul Marinos from uh, Athens in Greece in 2000. And what we tried to do was to develop a very simple chart used to be used visually by geologists to define the character of the rock as a number. And in intact rock, as you see here, the, the blue ellipse with the number 85 in the center of it is for massive, very sparsely jointed rock, uh, very clean, uh, uh, tight joints, and it behaves almost as an intact material, or does behave in the extreme where you have a GSI value of 100 as intact material. And that tends to uh, give us problems of brittle spalling uh, in tunnels and boreholes. That's the one extreme. We move on then to the blocky, uh, strong rock, tightly jointed, tightly interlocking, strong wedges, and uh, the, the, the column and the row reads blocky, uh, interlocked rock masses, and rough, not necessarily as strong as the, as the previous one, but still pretty good. Uh, and that gives us a GSI value of 65. And then we move on to multiply jointed rock, and this is from uh, the Solomon Islands in, in uh, northeast of Australia, a very active tectonic area, uh, and a site here, uh, uh, volcanic material, but very strongly jointed, so small blocks, uh, perhaps uh, 
10 or, or, or uh, 20 centimeters in size, four or five joint sets, very, very uh, tightly interlocking, but they're easily disturbed. So uh, blasting in that will, will simply call it to rattle down on the floor. Uh, and there we've got a GSI Vario 45. This is from Taiwan, and you've got folded uh, sedimentary rock there uh, where the, the original layers of sandstone have been broken up into little pieces. Uh, there's a lot of weathering. The, the material it, which was originally in the joints has, has become quite soft and, and of a lower shear strength. And so there we have a, a GSI number of 30. And finally, in the uh, material which in Greece is called flish, which is, uh, is a sedimentary material that was deposited before mountain building and subsequently completely tectonically deformed during the mountain process, mountain building process, uh, where there's no recognizable structure. It's, it's bordering on a soil, but it's still fundamentally rock particles uh, in, in intimate contact with each other. That then allows us <coughs> to develop a series of curves. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the detail of, of these in this lecture. There's, there's much too much detail to discuss. But you see there, going from uh, GSI of 85 in the top, the very strong, almost intact material, uh, very high compression stress, very low tensile strength, if any. Uh, and for all the other materials, where you have GSIs of 65, 45, 30, and 18, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that there is no tensile strength at your disposal, zero. So that uh, you still have compressive, uh, uniaxial compressive strength, uh, but as soon as you move into tension, it drops to zero. And uh, that's fundamentally important to, to have that kind of information available for our numerical models and analyses that we then use later on for engineering design. On the right is a different curve, and this is the uh, deformation modulus of rock masses with different GSIs. There are similar curves for other types of classification, and they all end up with roughly the same uh, uh, results. But this is one that, that I have used uh, for many years. So we have both strength and deformation characteristics, which we can then move, f move forward into design. Now, GSI cannot be used for a whole number of things. It cannot be used for intact rock or sp sparsely jointed rock, such as the wedge failures I showed you earlier in the photograph. It's, it, it has no meaning when used in that environment, none. It cannot be used for broken or transported materials. As you see here, this is a dam foundation excavation in Greece, and you see the benches uh, very nicely cut and designed at the top there, for which GSI is, is appropriate. That's, that's a, a reasonable tool. And then the spilt material and the waste rock, the broken rock, for which GSI is absolutely not applicable. Transported material, waste rock, soil, sandy soil, clay, none of those uh, can be uh, dealt with by GSI. There's one area which is marginally possible, and that is compacted rock fill, where you've taken a broken rock and compacted it back almost, almost to an interlocking rock, but not quite. And uh, uh, that's important in dam design. And in fact, this slide is of a very large triaxial cell for testing one meter diameter, two meter long coarse specimens of compacted rock fill uh, used in the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric project in Australia between 1949 and 1974. They built a huge number of dams and, and underground facilities. And so this was a key piece of equipment for testing those, uh, those core samples. And the behavior of that material is not too dissimilar from a, a weak rock. And concrete fits into the same general spectrum of behavior, and there are similar cells for testing concrete. This is a, a series of tests that was carried out in South Africa in the 1960s after a massive mine, coal mine collapse. And we mobilized a group of people to try and, and understand the strength of coal on a real scale, not, not little laboratory samples, which are very difficult to do in coal anyway, but at a scale approximately equal to the, to the field scale of coal mining pillars. And on the right there, you see a coal pillar 
which was about four feet high and uh, two feet by two feet in size. And on the left, you see a coal cutting machine, which is just a great big chainsaw, enormous chainsaw, which is used to actually cut the coal. And that was used to, to uh, cut the coal specimens, which were then loaded by the, the array of hydraulic jacks you see there and instrumented. And uh, uh, before testing the pillar, we, we drilled in stress measuring cells so that we could measure the stresses during loading. And on the right there, you see a uh, failed coal pillar. Those types of tests are extremely expensive, and uh, uh, you can't really do enough of them to, to build up a database of, of uh, sufficient information to do probabilistic analysis, but occasionally they're useful to do. Uh, we seldom do this kind of thing anymore, but we still do a lot of, of uh, plate uh, jacking tests or, or jacking tests to measure modulus in city, and I'll show you some of those in a moment. This is a, a dam project in China uh, where in situ shear testing was done. And you'll see the equipment there on the left. Uh, the vertical uh, blue hydraulic jack is to apply the normal load on the specimen, which is simply cut out uh, as you mine the, the trial tunnel in which the test is carried out. And the inclined blue one applies the shear load and uh, a set of instrumentation to measure the deformations and so on. On the right, you see the, the uh, shear surface, which had, had been tested and uh, to get one point on a shear strength curve. Uh, I remember visiting France many years ago with a, a dam engineer, Pierre Lund, and he showed me a large test that I'd done. And he said, uh, this test cost me a lot of money. And he said, it gave me one point on a curve, and I'll never do that again. So we don't tend to do too much of this. Uh, we tend to do it now. Uh, as I described in the previous lecture uh, in the series, by measuring the friction angle and adding the roughness, or the characteristics of the sheared surface, should I say. This was equipment uh, used uh, in Portugal in the 1970s, and what they did here was to drill a, a hole and then lower a, a saw. The, the hole was to accommodate the, the drive mechanism uh, for the saw, and cut a, a vertical slot into which was then lowered a, a flat jack consisting of two welded steel plates close to each other and uh, pump in uh, hydraulic fluid under pressure so that you're deforming the, rec the rock mass and measuring its deformation modulus. Um, the difficulty is uh, with flat jack testing of this kind, and there have been several attempts to do it, is you're very close to the surface. So the rock tends to be disturbed before you, you're uh, doing your test anyway. So much more typically, and this is still, that's a recent photograph in a hydroelectric project, we tend to do this with large hydraulic jacks. So you, you, you create an, an excavation, a trial tunnel or a, uh, an adit as we call it, and you put into it a, a large array of hydraulic jacks. And down the center between the four jacks there, uh, extensometers are inserted so that you can measure the, the deformation of the rock mass over a considerable depth below the loading pad of, of the jack. And there's one a vertical jack and another one horizontal jack uh, on a project in South Africa. And that, that type of testing is still done and is still very important because it, it uh, uh, calibrates the, the rock mass in, in, uh, on site in location. And here's a case history that wraps up this discussion because uh, we really need to have some means of confirming that all of the information we've gathered together and, and analyzed and come up with uh, failure criteria and, and uh, uh, done piecemeal testing pulls together and gives us a workable uh, rock mass model which actually does perform in the field. And so I'm going to go through a little case history here of the Drakensberg pump storage project in South Africa which was, was designed in the early 70s and completed construction by the late uh, 1970s. Uh, it's in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa, and it was a pump storage project, which means that during the generation of electricity, if you have a surplus, you pump water into an upper reservoir, and when you have a demand, you, you uh, 
lower the water down through the turbines and generate electricity. And it was in a very stable, predictable area of geology, uh, bedded sedimentary materials, sandstone, uh, siltstone, mudstone layers. And uh, we, because it was the first major underground excavation in South Africa, it was decided uh, with the agreement of the client to do two major in situ tests. One of them was this, where we took a, a, a three meter diameter concrete line tunnel, uh, bulkheaded it off, and loaded it under full pressure, and measured, we had many extensometers and piezometers in the rock mass around it and in the concrete, and measured the rock mass behavior uh, under test. Um, we also uh, did a, a test to simulate the creation of the arch of the, of the cavern. And there you see uh, horizontal bedding uh, in yellow and red, uh, representing a geological model of the, of the actual rock mass, and the profile of the cavern that was to be mined. And on the right you see a photograph of the cavern when it was mined with a trapezoidal roof and, and uh, uh, vertical walls. And as I say, this was the first major cavern constructed in South Africa. And so it was decided to make a model of that full scale. And so at the end, at the one end of the, end of the cavern, uh, we constructed the trapezoidal arch, left a pillar in the center, uh, left jacks in place to keep everything in place, and, and put support in. And we had extensometers, uh, the green line running up from the center of the crown there is an extensometer with multi multiple points. And so we could gradually release the load on the jacks, release the, the tension in the rock bolts, and see how the whole uh, uh, structure performed. And at that time, our models were very, very crude. We only had elastic numerical models. And uh, so we were not able to do non linear analysis. And uh, our analyses were fairly crude. The, the, uh, the cavern was successfully constructed, and it's still working. 40 years later, but uh, almost uh, 30 years later, I went back in 2007 and reanalyzed the extensometer behavior. Uh, and you see the graph on the bottom there where the dotted lines are uh, 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 measured and the solid lines are calculated and then the colors cor correspond. And so for rock engineering, that's pretty good. You couldn't do a lot better. So we had confidence then that this model actually worked. That confidence was tested recently because uh, about uh, 10 years ago, they started working on a sister scheme about 30 kilometers away. Uh, they needed another pump storage scheme. And so an, a new scheme called originally Bromhook, now called Ingula, was designed. And uh, so the question arose, could we use the data from Drakensberg in a rather similar, not identical, but similar rock mass setup uh, for the design of the Ngula underground excavations. And uh, I never went to site, but I corresponded a lot with the designers uh, because I'd worked on Drakensberg. And they then went ahead and designed a cavern using very similar, uh, a very similar rock mass model to that which I had derived from my back analysis. Uh, basically, what it showed was that uh, if we treated the horizontal layers of rock as intact beams with weak bedding surfaces, we got a very good agreement with the actual behavior as measured. And uh, that's the Angula cavern under construction. Uh, these are the, are the sequences. And uh, I'll be talking in, in uh, uh, lecture number six about the design of large caverns and about the need to sequence very carefully, design your, your structure. Because these days, we use rock as the engineering material. In the old days, we tended to build a, build, uh, construct a hole and then build a building inside it, uh, because the engineers didn't trust the rock. Now we know enough about rock to, to use the rock itself as the engineering material and to support it with cables and, and rock poles. And I'll talk about that in uh, lecture number six. But those are the the uh, layout of the extensometers and the excavation sequence. And there are two references there to papers describing this. And here are the measured deformations. 
the upper left and the lower right are deformations measured and calculated for the crown, and they're almost perfect agreement. The uh, upper right and the lower left are measurements in the sidewalls, which are a little bit more difficult because you have a very tall, irregular sidewall with different cutouts in it, and so you get slight variations in, in its behavior in terms of modeling. But again, in terms of rock engineering, these are excellent results. Uh, and to get this far, I think, is, is uh, pretty good. Thank you for your attention.